Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday School lesson for Sunday, September 25th, 22. Uh, this is uh, an online Sunday School lesson prevented for the benefit of those that cannot attend church or may be uh, disabled, not may able to physically make it to church. Let me first of all say happy fall to you. Uh, it's that time of year. Uh, I've noticed that the leaves are starting to turn color and start actually I've actually seen some starting to fall. So welcome to fall, y'all. I also want to say this morning, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, as you might have noticed last week, I made a post. Uh, if we could get 10 more, we would break a record. Uh, last Sunday, uh, September 11th, we had 193 views of our Sunday School lesson. Uh, I had posted hoping we could get to 200, uh, but did that fantastic that our Sunday School lesson is going into places, 193 places, uh, to help those people that might not get a Sunday School lesson. The title of today's lesson is Hope in God. Uh, the teacher's book explained our lesson this way. God offers those who are called by his name and come to him in repentance, hope. God offers hope. In this lesson, uh, let me challenge you to find a connection between uh, this lesson uh, from Amos, which was written approximately 2,800 years ago, as we've discussed the last few weeks, and the hope that can be found today through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, as we study today, I wanted to get in your mind what hope is. Uh, if you think of hope as a noun, hope is a feeling of expectation and a desire for a certain thing to happen in the coming future. If you want to think of hope as a verb, that is to want something to happen or want something to be the case in the future. Uh, I'll give you an example that's prevalent today. I hope through our church's revival services uh, and the revival messages that people in our church will come to know the Lord better and understand His purpose uh, for their lives. Uh, I hope through prayer that my prayers will be answered. My hope is that my prayers uh, for those that I'm praying for this week and those that I'm praying for on a regular basis uh, will understand and see God working in their lives. The teacher's book had a first thought regarding hope. Hope is not passive. You cannot sit on the couch and hope something will happen. Let me explain. And they did a good job of this. A football team can hope to win the game Friday night, but to help your, but to hope and to help your hope to come to fruition, the entire football team must practice all week to get ready for the game. The football team cannot sit in the gym and hope to win Friday night. A future college graduate can hope to graduate when they start college, but if they sit on the couch in their dorm room all four years of college and not study for their courses, hope will not come. Hope will fail. That person most likely will not graduate. Uh, as, I, as I studied that one and saw it in a teacher's book, I had to think about uh, my time in college uh, several years ago, uh, but my first college roommate uh, from my hometown and a good friend of mine uh, tried something when he got to college. The entire first semester, he was out every day just checking out the college scene, and he never seemed to study, and he always was gone while I was in the room every day. I always set time after supper till bedtime, Sometimes bedtime never came. Sometimes I studied all night. But he was out doing the college scene while I was in my room studying. He, finished, he flunked out of college after the first year. His hopes of graduation were ended. 
as I continued to study and worked hard, of course, my hope finally came true uh, as I did pass and was able to graduate from college. As I mentioned, we can hope our revival at Aceville will reach people for the Lord. However, if we don't pray and invite, our hopes will have no fruit. People in the church must be willing to let God into their hearts to have revival in our church, in our community, in our state, in our country. And believe me now, I'm praying for revival in our country. My prayer is that our church will get revival started and that will lead to our country seeking God in our everyday lives. As we went to the grocery store this week uh, and, and was getting our weekly allowance of groceries, which uh, nowadays is a small fortune due to the inflation caused by the leaders of our country, had someone behind us mention, and he had a loaf of bread, and he had a name brand loaf of bread, and as it was being checked out and saw the price that the cashier put up on the cash register, he, he, saw, he said to us, I just can't afford the bread anymore. And the cashier said, well, why don't you go back and get the company brand? Said, it's a lot cheaper. And a lot of people are buying it nowadays because of the inflation caused by the leaders of our country. Amos in our lead lessons so far this month has expressed hope given to him by God for him to express to the country, to the remnant of Israel. God give him hope that, in, that God would save at least a remnant, a small portion from Israel. Remember Amos chapter 5 verse 15 that we studied last week. Amos prayed, hate evil, love good. Establish justice in the gates. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph, another name for the country of Israel. To start our lesson, let's return to the outline of this short book of Amos that I shared with you back in the first week of September. Chapters 1 and 2 is eight burdens or oracles that God give Amos regarding the neighboring countries around Israel how he was going to cause the neighboring countries to their knees by this thing called a fire. Chapters 3, 4, 5, and 6 were three different sermons presented by Amos to the country of Israel. The first sermon in chapter 3 was to the clan of Israel. The second sermon in chapter 4 was to the cows of Bashan. And the third message or the third sermon was addressed by Amos to the country of Israel, and that's found in chapters 5 and 6. In chapters 7, 8, 9, which we're going to study today, Amos revisits or sees five, sermon, five visions from God. Remember in his three sermons, Amos had warned Israel that they must repent or the day would come when they would have to face God's wrath. Let's look at those five visions. You'll have to turn with me in your Bible, so get your Bibles out today. Get ready. If you need to, pause this lesson and go get your Bible and come back because I want you to go with me and I want you to see these five visions that Amos presented to the country of Israel. And this was the northern country of Israel. Amos chapter 7, verses 1, 2, 3. Thus he showed me, Talking, Amos is talking. Behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I, Amos, said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I'm setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise with the sword against the house of Jeroboam. You remember Jeroboam was one of the kings of Israel. God showed Amos in these chapters, he showed him a plumb line. And he said, the country of Israel is all plumb. It's not square. 
It's immoral. God said, I'm not going to pass by anymore. I give up on the country of Israel. It's time for them to face judgment. He says, I'm going to rise against the house of Israel, and I'm going to have the king slain by the sword. Next, let's look at the next vision. The vision of the locust. Chapter 7, verses 1, 2, 3. Thus the Lord God showed me. Behold, he formed locust swarms at the beginning of the late crop. Indeed, it was the late crop after the king's mowings. And so it was when they had finished eating the grass of the land that I said, O Lord God, forgive, I pray. O that Jacob may stand, for he is so small. So the Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. God showed Amos locusts coming, swarms of them, swarming of locusts that were headed to destroy the late crops of Israel. As Amos looked over the land of Israel and saw the locusts and how they had eaten all the grass and it was just dirt around him, Amos prayed, O Lord God, forgive us, I pray that Israel, your people, might once again stand and turn back to you. Verse 3 says, The Lord heard Amos' prayer and answered his prayer. The Lord said, Okay, I forgive. Today I pray, Lord, answer my prayers. Let others that I am praying for know that I am praying for them. The second vision was from Amos chapter 7, verses 4, 5, 6. Thus the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord God called for conflict by fire, and it consumed the great deep and devoured the territory. Then I, Amos, said, O Lord God, cease, I pray. O that Jacob may stand, for he is small. So the Lord relented concerning this. This also shall not be, said the Lord God. The visions of the fire. In the second vision, God sent a great fire. He devoured everything in its place. Amos saw the destruction, and he prayed. God, please forgive us, your people, Israel, the remnant that still remains, that still stays faithful to you. God heard Amos' prayer, and he stopped the fires. Today, I pray. Lord, I see fires, wildfires in some of our states out west. I see no rain as the people fight these fires. I know many of these states have passed laws that are in total disrespect to your word. But yet, Lord, I pray today for the remnant of people in those states that still serve you. I pray, Lord, for that remnant. Please send them rain, water, and stop the wildfires. As you do that, Lord, cause our hearts to turn back to you so that we might be another country united. In your work, Lord, is my prayer. Let's go back to the vision of the plumb line. I made a mistake at the beginning. This was the third vision, not the first vision. And it comes from Amos chapter 7, verses 7, 8, 9. Thus he showed me Behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I'm setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise with the sword against the house of Jeroboam. A plumb line is a heavy pointed device at the end of a small string. When front from on high will develop a perfectly true line and square line from top to bottom. Amos sees a plumb line from God. God positioned this plumb line against the nation Israel and found the line would never show true or square for them. Thus God told Amos that he was in Israel was in moral decay. They were morally crooked. Consequently, God was going to, to rise up against Israel 
and destroy all the shrines to false gods. God was going to rise up against Israel. For my prayer for this part today, Lord, this vision, I pray today, Lord, as you look at our country and see the unsquare plumb line of the United States. Lord, we pray today for our corrupt leadership and that you will cause our leaders to stop. See the plumbing, crooked plumb line that God has placed before us where they're leading us and turn their evil ways. Verse 9 says he's going to destroy the leadership of King Jeroboam with the sword. This is a warning that he gave to the leadership of Israel. If you don't straighten up your plumb line, I will destroy you. A warning to our leaders. If you don't straighten up and follow God's word, God will take care and God will send judgment to you. The fourth vision is the vision of the basket of ripe summer fruit. It's a long scripture, but it's chapter eight. Thus the Lord God showed me, behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what do you see? So I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. And the songs of the temple shall be wailing in that day, says the Lord God. Many dead bodies everywhere. They shall be thrown out in silence. Hear this, ye who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail, saying, when will the new moon pass that we may sell a grain and the Sabbath that we may trade wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel large, falsifying the scales by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, even sell the bad wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget of their works. Shall the land not tremble for this? And every one mourn who dwells in it. All of it shall swell like the river, heaven and subside like the river of Egypt. Heave and subside, I'm sorry, like the river of Egypt. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feast into mornings and all your songs in the lamentations. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like morning for an only son and it's in like a bitter day. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land. Now listen carefully. Not a famine of bread, not a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro seeking the sword of the Lord and the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. In that day, the fair virgins and strong young men shall faint from thirst. Those who swear by the sin of Samaria who say, as your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Beersheba lives, they shall fall and never rise again. The fourth vision, the vision of the basket of ripe summer fruit. God showed Amos a basket of summer ripe fruit. As I studied this lesson this week, knowing that summer is about to come to end, I couldn't help but think three or four years ago, I had a very good friend of mine that listens to this lesson almost every week when he's feeling up to it. He gave me a few muscadine and a few scuppadine vines to plant. I didn't know which was each. After three years now, almost four years, I had a very good few muscadines and a few scuppardines this year to eat. As I was out walking, I would stop and gather me two or three scuppardongs, and I would eat those things and think, how sweet, how beautiful. As I would continue and make another lap, I would pick a few muscadines and eat it and think, oh Lord, thank you for having that friend give me a few vines. Maybe now I can have a few each year. Like the ripe fruit as it comes to an end at the end of summer, God says the time had come for Israel 
Israel must face its judgment. Now listen to me. And I read this very strong. God promised after the ripe fruit, a famine was going to come to Israel. And he made it very clear. Not a famine of bread and not a famine of rain, but a famine of God talking to them, sending his word to them. God says, my patience with Israel has come to an end. As we all know, after Israel was destroyed by Babylon and its people carried away into exile, there is a period of time from about approximately 500 B.C. until Jesus was born in 2 A.D. that God sent no word at all. There's nothing in the Bible that pertains to those years. There was a gap where God stood still and did not speak to his people, did not say a word to put in the Bible. He didn't call, he didn't speak to his country Israel or its people. As God predicted, there was coming a time when the Israelites could no longer hear from God. A famine from God. Today I pray, Lord, I pray, please hear my prayer. Lord, don't leave us. Lord, don't stop your word from coming our way. Hear our prayer, Lord, and let me see you working in my life. Let me see you working in other people's lives. Give us back the joy of knowing you in the way our parents did and our grandparents knew you. And Lord, bless us as we try to lead our children to know you as we know you. Lord, help us as adults, help us as leaders of our church to lead our young people back to knowing you. Lord, touch the hearts of our young ones, the young men and women that one day will lead our church. Lead our own children. Help them know you as we know you. Help them to hear from you as we hear from you. Lord, please, Lord, revive us again. Finally, the fifth vision was the destruction of Israel. Amos chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, 4. I saw the Lord standing by the altar, and he said, Strike the doorposts, that the thresholds must shake, and break them on the heads of them all. I will slay the last of them with a sword. He who flees from them shall not get away, and he who escapes from them shall not be delivered. Though they dig into hell, from there my hand shall take them. Though they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. And though they hide themselves on the top of Mount Carmel, from there I will search and take them. Though they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea, from there I will command the serpent and it shall bite them. Though they go into captivity before their enemies, from there I will command the sword and it shall slay thee. And I will set my eyes on them for harm and not for good. In this final vision, God is standing at the doorpost of an altar that was changed from worshiping the true God to worshiping false idols. Many feel God is describing the altar at Bethel, the king's sanctuary. In this vision, he strikes the pillars and knocks them down to destroy the pagan worship that was going on in this place where they used to worship him. Then he says something else in verses 8, 9, and 10. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Yet I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. For surely I will command and will sift the house of Israel among all nations, as grain is sifted in a sleeve. Yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, who say the calamity shall not overtake nor control us. You've heard your parents say as you were growing up, you cannot do anything that your parents will not find out about. Seems like our parents always had their eyes on us. Likewise, God tells Israel, I have my eyes on you, Israel. I know which ones of you sinned. 
I know which one of you are still faithful to my word. And because of your moral decay, Amos preaches that God is going to destroy everyone in all their sins. He's going to sift those through a sieve, just like you would sand and gold. The sinful ones will be destroyed. The good ones will be saved. But then Amos closes his book with talking about the future. Turn with me now to chapter 9, verses 11 through 15, and let's finish up the book of Amos. On that day I will rise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages, and raise up its ruins, and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name says the Lord who does this thing. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. Inhibit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their land. And no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. The book, the teacher's book and the commentary entitled this, What About the Future, Lord? In the closing verses of Amos chapter 9, God gives the remnant of Israel that small portion that remained faithful to him. And yes, there were some Gentiles that had remained faithful to him. A glimmer of hope. In that day, God says, a day when God's word says there will be a return of God's people, a restoration of lives, a gathering of his people. After God's judgment on Israel and a time of famine of no word, God promised he will return and restore God's dwelling place. The book of Amos ends with God's promise to plant them in their land where they would never again be uprooted. Amos closes by saying, Thus saith the Lord God. As I close this morning, I had a thought uh, on how I might close this. Uh, I've never had any wrecks, moving wrecks, except one. Uh, the other little bump-ups I've had have always been in the parking lot. But I've had a big wreck in my life. I've had one moving wreck in a car. I was coming out of a small town north of us after a night shift of work. It had been a long night. And as I was coming out of town, I noticed this older man run a stop sign and then pulled out in front of me. I saw him pull out in front of me, and it was like time stood still. I had time to think. Can I avoid this accident? Can I do something? Can I turn to the left? Can I turn to the right? What will happen if I turn to the left? What will happen to th if, if I turn to the right? So I determined to make a right swerve, a small one, and hit him at a glance on his front end, rather than T-boning him and possibly hurting him. I ended up turning my car over a couple of times in a ditch. Both our vehicles were total wrecks, but we both were able to walk away with minor injuries. It was just like time stood still during the entire wreck. As Glenn Amos closed his book around 750 B.C., he envisioned a, a future where time was going to stand still. We were going to have a famine where we would not hear from God. But yet Amos looked forward and looked toward Israel's future. In his vision, he saw an era of abundance and prosperity when all the seasons would blend together in one long harvest. The prophet says the harvester would not be able to keep up with the abundance and would run in to the reaper. And upon his return, God tells Amos that never again will Israel have to be uprooted 
from its land. Israel, as history goes, was restored again as a country in 1948, just as God had told Amos. For you see, God's word is always true. God's word will always stand. You can trust if you pray to God, you will get an answer. You will get an answer from God. As we've learned in the last few weeks, sometimes an answer is yes. Sometimes that answer is no. And sometimes that answer is God says he will continue to test you so that you will become a more faithful servant of his. Lord, at this time, we thank you for our study in Amos. We thank you for the 193 people that viewed our lesson last week. Lord, continue to bless those people that listen. Help them to want to come back and hear the ending of this book of Amos this week as we present it and put it up online. Lord, bless our revival services. Bless the leaders that we have now of our church. Help them to always turn to you and be faithful to you in the services of the church. Help us to be faithful to always pass our love for you down to the next generation so that they can grow up knowing God as we know you, Lord. Help us to always stay and never give up on you, Lord. Forgive us of our sins. Lord, bless Brother Mark. Bless little Emily. Bless the Shore family. We're still thinking about them, Lord. Bless Brother Harold. Uh, bless Brother Dave and Brother Dave, Lord, his upcoming surgeries on the horizon, Lord. We've come to love these two folks, and we pray that you'll bless them as they go before you and before the doctors. Lord, give the doctors your knowledge of what to do to make them better. Lord, bless our church and forgive us of our sins. Cleanse our hearts. Bless our revival services, Lord, and help us always be a lighthouse on the hill to share your word. First in Christ's name we pray. Amen.